Hey guys, before we start the show, I just want to give a quick shout out to another podcast. Hey there, my name is Andy, host of the History of Africa podcast. If you like learning about the history of the Asia Pacific, I bet you'd also like learning about the history of the African continent. Our current season is focused on ancient Egypt. If that sounds appealing to you, come check out the History of Africa podcast here on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, and on our website, historyofafricapodcast.blogspot.com. Back to you, Craig. Well, hello there. Welcome back to the Pacific War Channel. The channel will recover the entire history of the Asia-Pacific War of 1937 to 1945 and all the major events that led up to it. Long and behold, today we're going to be discussing the Second Opium War of 1856 to 1860. And as usual, I will ask my colleague who has joined us for, I believe, the third time, Mr. Justin, what do you think of the episode? Well, like last time, folks, and I stand with you on this, it, it was a long one. They and, are, uh, yeah. it, it, it required a good nap somewhere in between. Uh, it was interesting to see that... You know, very much like you said when it came to the Treaty of Versailles, that a lot of the agreements made after the First Opium War are in fact the grievances that caused the Second Opium War. And it's uh, it's quite something to see when, uh, you know, you'd assume everybody's on board with a treaty, but once the, uh, <laughs> yeah. once the doors are closed behind them, a lot of shit can go wrong. You know, a big part of the, that problem was the treaty never answered the most important question, opium. Uh, that was actually really the root cause of all these issues. And uh, just to clarify, because we definitely need notes on this one. I had, I think I had 40 pages of research written and only about 20 made it to the episode. But just to get back to the Treaty of Nanking that occurred after the First Opium War was consisting of China paying $21 million to Britain over a three year period, the release of all prisoners, Hong Kong was now Britain's colony, and Britain could have permanent residence at the ports of Canton, Amoy, Fuzhou, Ningbo, and Shanghai. And the end of the Canton system, which was the uh, rigid trading system that they had where, you know, foreigners would come in, they'd be treated as barbarians, and they'd be tributaries to the emperor. I like to... Li I like to make a comparison because a lot of historians do this. The Treaty of Nanking has often been compared to the Treaty of Versailles because both technically caused second wars after they were signed. And for those uh, who aren't aware, the Treaty of Versailles was uh, the signing after World War I in which Germany had to make unbelievably humiliating terms upon themselves. And uh, I mean, I'll just say a few of them. Germany had to hand over about 10% of its territory, and this meant all overseas possessions demilitarize itself. Only it was allowed 100,000 troops, and this meant very few mechan like they couldn't have any planes, they couldn't have tanks. They actually had to go to the Soviet Union to train secretly. Uh, the occupation of the Rhineland by France, their sworn enemy, and to hand, hand over Alsace-Lorraine, which was unbelievably fought over. I mean, it changed hands over three times. The breaking of the Anschluss, meaning Austria had to break off of Germany. Poland was a new country and formed, which cut Germany off from Prussia, which was hilarious. There was also Danzig that was created. The Allies were going to be allowed to do a war criminal trial, which would have implicated Kaiser William II, uh, which didn't occur because he ran away to the Netherlands. And over $33 billion in reparations for war guilt, because everybody blamed Germany for World War I, which wasn't fair. And all of this humiliation led a certain person we now know as to be Adolf Hitler, to use all the humiliation and terrible stuff that happened to Germany to form a new government and form World War II as we know it. The Treaty of Nanking humiliated China almost identically to this situation. And you know what? Economic turmoil was involved as well. And we got a second opium war in the end. 
Yeah. Well, getting into that a little bit, uh, you know, the, the issue, what you said, is that uh, the Treaty of Nanking never really addressed the, the elephant in the room as far as the first opium war, opium which, was, w which was the opium trade. But if you go deeper than that, it's, again, why was the opium trade necessary? Which was British, again, lacking funds to pay for tea and other goods that had in China. They didn't have any other goods that they wanted to trade. As you got into the episode in the Second World War, speaking, uh, Britain tried to trade some textiles, but Chinese preferred their own cotton and silks over that. Major so, oversight. And the reality of it is, is that even after the First Opium War, that deficit and that need for English tea never really got satisfied. Now, a lot of people are saying, okay, you know, they received $21 million, and if you go back that many years, it, it does seem like a decent sum of money. Yeah. But when you realize how much the British actually lost when all the opium was seized in the first war, which yeah. this, in turns, was somewhat supposed to be reparations for that. It officially was not, but it absolutely was. Yeah. And the other thing, now this I wasn't able to research, but in the first opium war, weren't many of the British merchants promised reparations once they got paid for that seized opium? Yeah. So you could assume, rather than going back to purchasing tea itself, this $21 million all got filtered down into the British merchants that lost their opium and their and their big businesses practices in the first place. So the, the $21 million really is just a drop in the bucket. It, it doesn't solve England's problem whatsoever. They still were very, very low on their reserves of silver. They had very little income coming from other countries other than India a little bit. And it never really solved the root problem. <clears throat> so add that on top of China's humiliation, and you're really brewing into a second conflict. Yeah, and uh, as anyone would tell you, the worst thing, again, is the ambiguous nature of the opium trade. The treaty did not end it. It did not really uh, talk about it, to be honest. Hilariously, the whole point of the war was the opium problem, and they never acknowledged it, both sides, for obvious reasons. But as a result, um, as soon as the first opium war was open, opium doubled up on Britain. I had a chart here. I don't know. Maybe I can edit it into the episode, but it just shows you. In 1835, we're seeing about 1,390 chests or tons of opium. After 1839, this goes to about 2.5 thousand. And then 1863, we're at about 4.2. And then it goes on to almost about 7,000 by the 1880s. It just kept getting more and more and more. I mean, how much can China really bear? Because we're, we're, we're not just talking about an unequal... Uh, it's not just economics. This is an illicit drug that was affecting the society. And for a bunch of humiliated commoners, uh, they were going to fall victim to opium dens. And it was going to, you know, just run rapid upon the society. There was people not working, you know, there was dissatisfaction with everything else that was going on in the world for China and then you know just to make things even worse uh, they had something like 80% opium addicts within their military for a while it's, uh, it's unbelievable and uh, it goes without saying that opium was coming into China and silver was going out as we saw with the first opium war yeah <clears throat> and despite China having stocked uh, stockpiled all that silver for many many years the truth is, is, as it starts to bleed out, and China being, <clears throat> sorry, China being on the back end of the first opium war, also dealing with crazy, crazy internal problems with rebellions left, right, and center. Every I believe years. you have an episode coming out on the Taiping Rebellion, which was a big one. Yep. Um, so they're just bleeding money into their economy, into their military, uh, into their government, trying to figure out. You know, not only who's in charge, but trying to keep them in power. Because every time there's a flip in power, a lot of money disappears. Uh, and it's just very, very difficult for them to sustain this. And all that on top of trying to deal with the opium crisis. And people are getting high, not doing their jobs, are simply disappearing. It, it makes it a very, very difficult time for China to regulate all this. Mind you, there's a lot of Qing officials and smugglers within China that were reaping the benefits of this. You know, it, like I keep saying to a lot of people uh, who are making remarks about, you know, the evil nature of Britain during this time. Yes, of course, what Britain did was evil, but don't forget, it takes two to tango, and uh, there was rapid corruption within the Qing dynasty. A lot of officials were completely, you know, they were involved in this. It was, it was 
Mm. Not to say it's an inside job, but a lot of people were making money within China also. I'm sure there's a few lesser known family names that have a nice inheritance passing down uh, generation to generation. Oh, definitely. Hidden in the floorboard somewhere. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's unavoidable with these things. Again, when government is chaos, uh, a lot of things get lost in the in the in the fog, so to speak. Uh, I didn't actually call this term uh, when I did the episode because uh, I'm not an economic historian by any means, nor am I a Chinese historian for that matter. I specialize more in Japanese history. But in just some minor research, when I was looking back at this subject, I came across a term that's being used called the Daogong Depression. And I was interested by it. So it refers to a year span of about the 1820s to the 1850s. And it really is kind of a cataclysm of just terrible events that happened within China that led to just much unbelievable economic unrest and more silver being depleted from their country. Of course, you know, if we name the big ones, yes, the first opium war was a huge catastrophe. And yes, they had to pay reparations. They <laughs> had to pay damages to their country. They had to lose territory, uh, the people were dissatisfied, and the people rebelled. We'll see that with the Taiping Rebellion. But what also happened was the imperial court, uh, which used to, you know, you would have to take an imperial exam to be an uh, official service member within the country. They needed more money, and this led to more corruption. And instead of having, like, rigorous examinations for everybody, some of the more wealthy officials just simply bought their positions probably because their daddies were opium merchants. And a lot of incompetent, complete morons uh, became officials in the courts, as I did mention in the episode, and they didn't really help when the Second Opium War kicked off or when the Taiping Rebellion kicked off, which was actually much worse than the Second Opium War. But needless to say, on top of all of this horrendous stuff that's going on, they have a massive overflow of a river within China that leads to a entire famine of a region, which that's not going to pay for itself, mind you. And that led to further turmoil, which led to a certain individual claiming he was the brother of Jesus Christ, and he led a rebellion that killed about 20 million Chinese. Uh, that's a lowball figure. It could have been somewhere up in uh, 30 million. So, yeah, like, the Qing Dynasty got hit with so many things over the course of just, you know, like, 20-something years. There's, there's no way they were like financially gonna pick themselves out of that hole, let alone you know keep their population uh, at all satisfied. Yeah, and let's not forget too, uh, with the British and the French now rolling into the ports, not just them, and, <clears throat> and trying to trying to use the benefits of the uh, sorry of the treaty itself. China's losing a lot of revenue from the ports itself because when they had unanimous yeah. control, they're taxing every import, every export, and every sale or every trade but they lost to the fullest way. extent. Now they don't have that monopoly anymore. So makes it, uh, again, harder to control what's coming in, what's going out, yeah. and also harder to at least put a dollar figure to it. Even if they knew opium was coming in before, which they did, they still found a way to tax and cheat and at least make somewhat of a profit off of it. Yeah. Now they're getting very, very little of that. So That's why they call them the unequal treaties. So actually, after the Treaty of Nanking, you could find a, a list of other treaties that came just after it between different entities. Because like he mentioned, Britain, France, Russia, the United States, actually Germany too was there. They're not talked about they all were invested in this pie that was uh, the Qing Dynasty, and they were cutting from it. And all these treaties were completely not for the, the poor Chinese. And uh, it actually, the, um, it's colloquially known in China as the Hundred Years of Humiliation, I believe it's called. And it starts after the First Opium War, and it just gets worse and worse. Uh, goes on to the Boxer Rebellion, etc. And uh, I only touched about I only touched upon this like a little bit, but uh, the coolie trade uh, kind of was vigorated by this whole situation. The British kicked that off, and uh, I didn't get to really say much about it except for you know the humorous um, humorous. It's a little dark, but uh, the term being Shanghai actually referred to Chinese people being drugged up and thrown on boats to do slave labor in other countries. And I looked into this just a little bit more because I was curious myself. And I found out that when Britain was starting this uh, pig trade, as it was known, or the poison trade, 
Uh, over 200 Chinese initially were brought to Trinidad in 1806. So this happened way before the first Opium Wars. And they worked there probably till their deaths. Britain ended up uh, abolishing slavery in 1838. But over 25,000 East Indians ended up in British East African colonies, such as Martinus, and oh my god, it's just, it's horrifying. Over 250 to 500,000 Chinese coolies were imported from 1847 to 1874 to various colonies, not just within the British Empire, but within French, Dutch, and Spanish colonies all across the Americas, Africa, and Asia. I mean, as Canadians, we know, we, we know this the stories of the railroad work within our country and it occurred in the United States and this is part of uh, this ugly time. Uh, my God, talk about it. I mean, in Canadian history, we had the Chinese head tax where uh, we brought over these poor coolie workers to work on the railroads and then we didn't allow their families to come with them because we didn't actually want them to be part of society. We wanted them to work for cheap and get out. Uh, it's an ugly past that Canada definitely needs to recognize. <laughs> But uh, it kind of started with the British and the Opium Wars was a real kickoff for this ugly system. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the things that's seldom talked about in economics, because it is a very dark part of history, but is very, very relevant in both past, present, whatever economics, is the trade of flesh, the trade of people. Obviously, a lot now, and it's a horrible, horrible thing, but... In many times and many cultures, it's sort of what made the economy go around. Yep. Because when you trade for flesh, you're not just getting an apple or a material good. You're getting something that you could potentially have growth out of. You're getting labor. You're getting uh, to security. It didn't matter if you were using them as soldiers, as laborers, as whatever, concubines, whatever it was. But you were getting more and more financial gain out of it which is what made it not only a possibly lucrative practice, but such a popular one pretty much all around the world, uh, depending on the time period. So, uh, you know, and as, uh, as China's going through, again, more and more financial turmoil, they're trying to find ways to rectify this, and part of it was the coolie trade. Yeah. And uh, honestly, it's usually the highlight when anyone, when anyone talks about the Second Opium War, if they ever even acknowledge it. It's not uh, as well known as the First Opium War. It's sometimes not even called that. It's called just the, uh, the Arrow War, because that technically was the official term for it. Uh, the, I mean, other than the outcome and the opium trade, one of the biggest things that occurred in the Second Opium War, which I did talk extensively about in the end of the episode, was the burning and looting of the old Summer Palace. And I could not talk about too, too much because, I mean, I only had so much time in the episode. But I did want to take some time here to actually speak about it because it's still an issue today. I found a lot of surprising information on it. So the old Summer Palace, which was looted predominantly by the French, mind you, and the English afterwards, we saw... To, we're having estimates of about 10 million antiquities being removed from China. And... Over 1.5 million of them were found, oh, excuse me, 1.6 million were found in uh, British museums alone, which is incredible, but I mean, it's Britain. They've looted from many countries, uh, Egypt to uh, Greece. But uh, I was trying to get figures on how much exactly was stolen. You know, for the life of me, I can't get a real estimate. And I honestly think that's because it's just such an incredible number. And it's hard to place a value on centuries of historical items as such. It, it's li If you read about what was in this place, it's, it's just incredible what was stolen. Uh, just to look at it, I wanted to find some estimates uh, here. It, it was mentioned in a primary source that 300 carriages were used by the French to bring the loot away after three days of looting. And that alone says a lot because, I mean, this was jewels gold. Uh, a lot of silver objects, uh, and jade, of course. But uh, I was looking for a more recent problem, and I found that in 2018, something called the Tiger Ying, which was an archaic bronze water vessel, was taken by British soldiers at the time, and it sold recent, oh, in 2018, for 410,000, no, four, yeah, 410,000 410, pounds. British pounds. Pounds. And it was stolen. Oh, they have the name of the soldier. It was Royal Marine Captain Henry, Harry Lewis Evans. And this item was one of seven vessels known in existence, five of which are in museums. 
and China's cultural cultural heritage department is still providing lawsuits to get any of these items back because they're all over the world mostly in Britain and French museums mind you but yeah um, we're talking unspeakable amount of money worth of items like it, hundreds of millions of dollars by today's standards for sure if not more yeah it's uh it's been linked to the burning of the uh, library of alexandria as kind of uh, a loss of history because there was something like a hundred thousand uh ancient literature books that were burnt also in the palace um it's it's a huge tragedy for the fucking for the world excuse me so getting into what we call the chinese humiliation or unfortunately or the hundred years of humiliation let's talk a little bit about uh, the actual battles that went down and those blessed Chinese cannons that we've discussed oh. so many times in uh, in other episodes. You know, the only thing I'd say about the difference between the you know the two wars is China got to fight back a little bit harder this time. Uh, we see that the Daku forts, uh, the British and French got bogged down in the mud, and you know under the leadership of a Mongolian prince, uh, the Chinese were able to win and you know kill some of the invaders. Mind you, uh, they just came back and destroyed them right after. Uh, there was a horrible instance, and I mentioned in the episode, where a French general, I think it was Montauban, he used Chinese coolies, uh, he sent them to go into the moats with ladders on their backs, and then the soldiers just climbed over them to get into the Daku forts. And uh, one of the British, I think it was General Hope, Grant, he was so embarrassed by the situation, he felt so bad that he gave them a... A monthly bonus of their salary but <laughs> that that probably wasn't that much to when honest. your salary isn't much uh, yeah a monthly bonus doesn't do you a whole lot but yeah. but uh, you know it, it's it's almost embarrassing to try and, and talk about this you know particularly when all your your sources are, are British or French you know they embellish the truth a little bit and they make it seem like it was a little easier than it should have been but uh, the difference in technology was even worse in the second open more than the f and then the first uh, the Armstrong field gun was in play and <laughs> it, it, It's like uh, Mike Tyson fighting an infant, you know <laughs> They uh, they massacred uh, the Qing Dynasty forces uh, a lot of Aboriginal Chinese communities also suffered because they were thrown in as vanguards and uh, they were using traditional weapons like uh, spears and swords and uh, they were fighting Armstrong field guns so you can imagine it was pretty horrifying yeah now in terms of uh you know kicking off a lot of these raids on the forts uh seemed to be a bit of a miscommunication between lord elgin and his brother <laughs> who were on completely different wavelengths when it came to uh okay so the treaty is signed by everybody except the one signature that matters yeah um the primary source <clears throat> and i'm talking about something that was written then actually called his brother a moron that, that says enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. his brother was an idiot. And I mean, to be brothers to uh, Lord Elgin, who's kind of a, a renowned person, and uh, we're, we're from Canada, Lord Elgin was the best, arguably, yeah, he's probably the, arguably the best governor our country had. He was the guy to actually bring responsible government to Canada before we were a, a real country. And he um, kind of helped with uh, the French-English situation. Mind you, if you're French, you don't think he helped much. He, uh, he kind of quelled the uh, French resentment to being conquered. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but by today's standards, too, in terms of being a Canadian, I'd say he's probably the most recognizable figure from all these conflicts, with the Definitely. exception of maybe an emperor. But uh... you, There's a hotel in Montreal, Lord Elgin's mm -hmm. hotel, and there's a, a monument to him there. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, he, he really did make it, kind of all around the world so to speak and yeah. had his impact a little bit everywhere but you know to see that his brother's on his way back to China ready to start a fight expecting this treaty to be signed and then realizing it's actually not which is yeah, yeah. and then to replace your brother because he was so incompetent <laughs> it's pretty funny um I didn't make a note of this but um <sighs> At this, t at this time period, Lord Elgin is kind of seen as a little bit heroic in that he, he tried to stop some of the looting occurring at the Summer Palace and he frowned upon a lot of what was going on because he was seen as kind of a, um, an honorable man. 
I, I would like to take a note that after this incident, he is notoriously known um, for stealing some ancient Greek sculptures, uh, and it's colloquially known as Elgin's Marbles. It's a situation in which he went to Greece, he was an ambassador for the Ottoman Empire, I believe, and he just took these like priceless statues, brought them to his own estate in Britain, and they ended up in a museum, and Greece has, to this day, tried to fight to get them back from, I believe, the current Lord of Elgin, because there is still one to this day. And uh, yeah, it's a point of contention, but Britain stole a lot of stuff from people and put it in museums. <laughs> yep, poor, poor people of the world who had to live under the tyranny of the British Empire. Yeah, but I'm trying to figure out exactly how you could have a treaty set forth and a country would assume that it's in play when again it, it doesn't have the blessing of the emperor was it is there any sign that it was maybe just embellished and that elgin's brother oh. said it's been signed or did they just assume and walk in like idiots no it was classic chinese uh, maneuver the chinese love to just kind of, well, sorry it sounds bizarre to say that but uh, back in this time the uh, the way that negotiators would work in the qing dynasty or even in ancient china apparently they would try to prolong negotiation allow things to go off let things be forgotten never make yes or no answers because they were always trying to just play with it Okay. so that they could get a better outcome and they never want to you know officially put their stamp on anything so what they usually would do is if someone came over they go oh yes we're going to get the emperor to sign this but then they don't and if the emperor doesn't sign it it's not an official treaty signing so they don't actually have to abide by it but to the person they're dealing with or the country they'll you know kind of keep this shadowy oh yes 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 everything's fine and that's what they were trying to do yet again. And um, I even said in the episode, Lord Elgin, he actually educated himself on how the Chinese did dealt with negotiations and immediately realized this. So whenever he came aboard or was trying to talk to someone, he immediately threatened them. He said, okay, you have two days, we're gonna go to war. That's how he dealt with it. And it actually was the only way to, to deal with it. Well, it would seem that that stall tactic has been used quite a bit and would almost be, in a sense, maybe waiting for them to get a little bit in a bad position. Because you have to remember, the British and the French are the ones invading. And they didn't have that many people. So you'd think if they're spending so much time in, in foreign countries, foreign waters, yeah. this and that, if you're stalling out negotiations, not to mention just them communicating with their homeland must take a fair bit of time. You know, oh, actually, Not like they were uh, texting home back then. Actually, um, it didn't. One of the reasons why this war occurred was, I believe it was 18... Oh God, it's the 1850s, the, the telegram um, was operational, so they were able to talk to Parliament before, because you needed Parliament to declare war before you uh, went to war. It was the first time in history, I believe, that they were able to wire Parliament without having to travel all the way over there to declare war, so it kind of like sprang on the, uh, the Qing Dynasty. Okay, well I didn't realize that. That actually kind of solves that issue. Mm -hmm. But even then, having so many British soldiers, if they decided they needed either reinforcements or something like that, oh, of course, if the forever. Chinese are stalling them out, it gives them time to maybe get them in a bad position or spring a trap yeah. on them. But That's, I guess they yeah. didn't. Uh, they weren't able to stall it out long enough. Well, uh, the the Qing Dynasty had the numbers on their side by a long by a long shot. But this is the real reason why they didn't win. The Taiping Rebellion was happening, and the majority of the Qing Dynasty's forces were busy with uh, a faction of China that was winning against them. The Taiping Rebellion was very successful until they captured Nanking, upon which their leaders kind of settled and stopped. They could have at any point taken uh, the capital in, in Peking, but they didn't. They only sent a little piecemeal army, and it wasn't at all capable of uh, just taking down the emperor. If they did, and they could have uh, attacked Peking, they would have taken the throne for themselves. And then the British and French would be dealing with a much more awkward situation. Because the Taipings would have... I mean, they were against opium use. They actually were, and they you weren't allowed to use opium within the ranks so that would have been uh not not a great situation and it goes without saying that uh, i mean I, I think i say in this episode the british and the french immediately realizing what the taipings were like and not wanting to deal with them 
they eventually allied themselves to the Qing Dynasty immediately after this war is done. They gave their services up to fight the Taipangs. So, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it would be something to go in there. But after beating the, the Dynasty down and realizing that they're facing the Taiping Rebellion, you, you'd almost think they allied two of them sort of in an advantageous way to themselves because they had no choice either. Yeah, of course, they sold them weapons immediately. Uh, the famous Mongolian prince, uh, Singh, he immediately asked for help. He wanted to uh, have Armstrong field guns or other artillery to be able to fight off the Taipings, and I don't know if they ended up giving him anything. I think he got a few pieces, but uh, needless to say, they, they did defeat the Taipings, and it was large. Okay, I won't say largely because of uh, the Western support, but uh, the Shanghai region was protected by Western forces uh, after 1860 because they opened the port after winning the Second Opium War, and this was where they were selling their opium. So when the Taipings came in, who believed the Westerners would be part of their cause, coming to you know ally themselves to them, they just shot all the Taipings and basically announced that they were going to fight for the Qing Dynasty. And yeah, it'll be talked about in my other episode in, in depth. It's uh, it's actually uh, it's a lot more battle heavy than <laughs> this episode, to be honest. And getting back, I had a question for you about the Mongolians, because you did mention this in your episode. You mentioned something about uh, Elgin's brother making accusations against Russia, saying he saw uh, men in fur hats and coats. Did he mistake the Mongolians for the Russians? Uh, it was probably propaganda, and he was trying to target the Russians, because while all of this is going on, we're talking about the British and the French. Technically, the two other actors were the United States of America and Russia. Now, the United States of America was part of the war for a, a small part when there was shelling of Canton, uh, but the Qing Dynasty in America reached an agreement and there was a neutrality pact that was signed, which did not stop, and I have notes here on this, I wanted to talk about one instance, America broke its neutrality pact when a Commodore, Josiah Tattnall, Famously made a remark when the British were fleeing from a naval battle. He said, blood is thicker than water, and he provided cover fire, which was illegal, because they had a neutrality pact. Uh, there was other instances of Americans being involved in the Second Opium War, but it's like, I mean, uh, it's, it's not as if they had full engagement. They had a, a few ships, and they were kind of shelling places. I mean, they shouldn't have, but anyways. As for Russia, Russia was devious as hell during all of this. So the entire time this war is going on with the Taipings and the Second Opium War, there's a Russian ambassador within Peking uh, <clears throat> directly talking to them. And basically Russia had a bunch of territorial goals. They wanted to broker a, a deal. Eventually it became a treaty. I believe it's called the Treaty of Algin. I had it written here somewhere. But anyways, they wanted uh, a lot of Manchuria and... Uh, they basically wanted a pathway to the ocean from that area where Manchuria is. And they were looking at the situation and they knew that the Qing Dynasty was against the ropes. So conveniently, when the British and French were outside of Peking and they were shelling this, were going to shell the city, the Russian ambassador at the time, and I do have his name, it's impossible to pronounce, Ignatyevnyev, he was talking to Prince Gong, who was put in charge last minute. And Prince Gong begged the Russians to intervene to help them because they didn't want Peking to be destroyed. And he laid out five conditions to help. The five conditions were what I said. Uh, it, was to it was different territories, but more or less, just think of Manchuria. And better yet, uh, Vladio, uh, Vladio, what's the name of the port? Vladivostok? Vladivostok is what ends up being taken through this treaty that he forms with Prince Gong. So what he did was he said he would negotiate on behalf of the Emperor of China and try to make sure that all the Allied forces of British and French, once they didn't go negotiated, to just walk away peacefully, which he did. And then as soon as that happened, he kind of like threw some more stuff on his own treaty. So Russia had this separate treaty that was going on that was, it was a sneaky little land grab. And uh, it actually ends up being a huge problem for the Pacific War because uh, Russia, and, uh, Russia and Japan basically fought over Manchuria later. And uh, yeah, no, Russia played their cards right because they never had a single military engagement during all this, but they gained a ton of stuff. Rich lands, granaries in uh, Manchuria and all that. Yeah. So if you had all that uh, on top of that, uh, China losing Hong Kong, 
Seem to be uh, seem to be quite the land loss for them. Oh, they're gonna lose more land in the future. They'll lose uh, what is the present day Taiwan to the Japanese. They'll lose uh, actually more islands than that. Hong Kong will remain in British hands technically till 1990s if you think about it. I mean, it's a, that's a contention, you know, it's, it's an issue today still. Uh, Shanghai was split like a pie. Uh, Germany will come into the picture and everyone's going to have their area of Shanghai. It's called like an international zone. And uh, that it's a whole thing in the Pacific War of itself. But uh, China goes through a period rightfully called the Hundred Years of Humiliation. And it kind of started with, the, it started with the First Opium War. The Second Opium War made it really bad. The Taiping Rebellion really really made it Nail bad in the coffin there's going to be a lot more coming up and uh i kind of just wanted to finish off because i noticed in these little notes i i tried to find figures on the looting of the summer palace and based off of the auction that occurred after the french had looted everything that's a whole other issue but the british auctioned off everything that they could when they took it together and my report shows they got something around a hundred thousand dollars at that time one third of which went to officers, two thirds went to the NCOs, and on average, a private received about seventeen dollars each, and an officer around fifty dollars each. And the French got to walk off with everything that they stole, which was three hundred carriages of jade, jewels, and gold and silver. Apparently, uh, Hope Grant himself of Britain had a golden scepter with a giant diamond. And it was supposed to be handed over to Queen Victoria, but the scepter didn't have a diamond in it, even though the initial report said there was a giant diamond in the scepter. So, Gee, I wonder where that went. And there's like a whole thing written on how this diamond disappeared. And uh, I, I did make one mention, the Rothschild family. A baron of the Rothschild family had a private order with a French officer, and he told him to buy anything and everything with no matter the price tag on it during the auction, and he would take it. So I found that to be quite an eye-opener that Rothschild was involved in this, but uh, yeah. Well, like we said before, families who had money took advantage. Yeah, we're talking about centuries of looted goods that weren't, you know, necessarily Chinese. These were from Korea, Japan, any anyone who was tributary to them, like uh, Persia probably had some stuff. Even the Byzantine probably had given them something back in the day. There's all sorts of interesting goodies to steal. And you can see them probably today in any museums within Britain, mostly. I bet you in Canada, even we have something. I, I wouldn't know for life of me, because I'm not a scholar for this, but... Uh, yeah, no, museums are a dirty business. Yeah. Well, let's just say a lot of museums are definitely housing old, dirty goods. Hmm. But Technically looted human parts, too, if you think about it. Hmm. Yeah, there's bodies. That's it's a corpse of somebody. Someone had family back then. If you think about it that way, mm. yeah, I had a teacher who used to remark about anything that came from the Pacific War, so uh, Japanese items, it, it got really gross. Like, there was instances with which people's personal belongings were stolen and put in museums, like, 15, 10 years after the events. That That's like a guy's picture of his family, and it was put in a museum, and the guy very well has family members that could have been alive at the time. So a lot of gross stuff happens yeah, in history. I could go on forever about museums. It's, it's, they're great for learning, but not great for looting. Yeah, not like today where everything's donated or given or on loan to them exactly. Oh, there's so many regulations now. It's crazy. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. That's yeah. been an interesting rant today. I, I hope this is breaking kind of the rigid, you know, it's like a rigid nature. We're, we're developing this this discussion thing as we go along. Yeah, unfortunately, these uh, the, these opium wars really just have so much material, and so does the Taiping Rebellion. But after that, it gets less. I swear to God, I, I already filmed some stuff. I, I Don't worry, I'm hurting as much as you guys right now. The Taiping Rebellion episode that'll be coming out after this, uh, which is available in Podbean already as an audio format, is as long as this one. But after that is going to be the opening of Japan, which is at 25 minutes, I, I think, gathering from how I filmed it. And then the Meiji Restoration, which will be a little bit longer. But after that, I plan on doing the Boshin War, the Satsuma Rebellion, and I'll, I'll probably dedicate 20, 30 minutes to those. They're going to be shorter, more condensed. They're not large events. They're more like their wars are a little bit smaller. So things will get shifty. I mean, I, I don't want to make every episode like a documentary like these, but uh, yeah. 
Yeah, it's a lot to take in, but the reality is is that the, the these conflicts just have so many factors going into them, so many names being thrown around, so many different countries, so many different levels of society getting mixed into it that it's very, very hard to cover everything. Um, yeah. Uh, no, you know, I, I'd still say if anybody has questions or comments about it, feel free to put it in there, and uh, Craig can always try to answer, or we both can try to research uh, our best to figure out. Uh, yeah, I just let the audience know. I've had quite a few vocal members who've asked a lot of questions. Uh, shout out to Three Edge Sword. You have been awesome to talk to, and um, I did a live stream not too long ago where I was playing a game with some friends, Axis and Allies, he asked a lot of questions, particularly about the uh, the second opium war and stuff, and uh, I really do enjoy it. So, like, reach out to me, you know, ask everything you want, because the purpose of these, uh, I called them initially podcasts, it was more of a QA. and I just wanted to know from the audience, you know, what did you think, what would you like to know more about? Overwhelmingly, what I have found is a lot of Filipinos watch this, and they would like to dive right into the Pacific War, because this is a particularly large event for the Philippines. Uh, I will be coming out soon with a history of the Philippines up to the Pacific War, just to give an idea of how it came about and all the different players, because, you know, the interesting country <laughs> that a lot of people are coming and going, as you would say. Uh, I will also try and hit up Korea, God, Thailand, oh my God, Taiwan, there's, there's so many. I want to hit all the small, smaller nations that don't always get included into the big, you know, textbooks. Uh, India is a huge one, notoriously not talked about during the Pacific War, even though they had such a big war effort. And um, yeah, there's a lot to cover before I get to 1937. That's for sure. Yeah, and bear in mind, we're learning a lot as we as we research and go through this too. You know, it's uh, for sure. It's actually tricky to find specific documents on the economy and the financials of this because a lot of it got lost, uh, got lost in the fray. But uh, I'm doing a little bit of research on my own now, trying to find uh, primary sources and figure out a little bit more about what went on. So uh, it'll be a. Uh, it's actually a lot easier after the 1870s. Um, the records get unbelievably accurate mm. because there's a uh, what you would say technology was knitting the world so um, there was a lot more eyes on things a lot more bookkeepers going about mm. although not to say the Qing dynasty was f fantastic at, at keeping records as were the Japanese but just to say it gets better and uh, I think we've gone over the time a little bit I don't even know yeah. but uh, if you have more questions you know just throw them in the comments here or any of the episodes I think I've been pretty good with getting back to people and I mean I've had some paragraphs of uh, questions for some of these episodes let me know what you want to see in the future please leave a like and subscribe we're a small YouTube channel and I'm definitely not making many pennies off this <laughs> and uh, I hope to see you soon Pacific War Channel, over and out. Thank you very much, guys.